we are starting to see little pops of color amongst the trees. So grab your sweaters and cider donuts, people. It is fall in the capital region. Coming up on this episode of The Eagle, we'll go over the week's top headlines. It's another year where Capitol Holiday Lights in the Park is in danger of not happening. And we'll learn about one local physics professor's quest to seek out the truth about unidentified aerial phenomena. And instead of laughing about ha 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 flying saucers and little green men, I thought maybe scientists' curiosity should have been piqued instead of, you know, this derision and ridicule. This is The Eagle, a Times Union podcast, a look inside our newsroom. I'm Jessica Marshall. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring in you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union member today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome to The Eagle. I'm Jessica Marshall. Let's discuss now what appeared in the Times Union and on timesunion.com this week. This week, we are here with managing editor for news, Susan Mahalik, to talk about the top stories. Uh, Let's launch right into it. We're going to open here uh, with a story that we have published about the situation with home care workers in New York State. Uh, Just by way of background, home care workers, the whole industry kind of took a hit during the pandemic. Folks started leaving. The state allocated some money to help, you know, increase their salaries and draw them back. But that might not be where all the money's actually going. So can you tell us about that story? There is $7.7 billion set aside for uh, wage increases for the home care uh, worker field. And that was set aside in the state budget. And the wage increases are supposed to uh, take effect on October 1st. But what's happening right now is there are industry experts who are saying a lot of that money that has been set aside to pay for those raises may never end up where it's intended to go because it's going to end up in the pockets of private health insurance companies. And that's because the money that is paid to these home care workers is funneled through these private entities. And they apparently... Uh, have contracts for how much these workers will be paid. The Times Union was uh, able to look at a few of these contracts, and it shows that these negotiated reimbursement rates with the home care agencies are offering pay bumps as low as 20 cents or 50 cents per hour when the funding was intended to uh, pay for a $3 per hour minimum wage increase, which would be $2 this year and a dollar more next year. So there's concern that this money is, instead of getting into the hands of the people who need it most, that would um, potentially draw people back to the home care industry, uh, that it's not going where it's intended. So it's quite a quandary and we'll have to see what, what ends up happening with that. Absolutely. Check out our Capital Confidential section on timesunion.com for more on that. All right, let's move on to a story out of the Port of Albany, which they've turned down a substantial chunk of money toward a project that they wanted to do. Tell us more about that. Yeah, so um, you might be aware that there's this proposed $350 million project um, at the Port of Albany to build a wind turbine tower manufacturing facility along the Hudson. And a chunk of money for that project, $29.5 million, was supposed to be coming from some federal aid. And the port has decided to forego that almost $30 million in order to speed up the project. What has stalled the project is that over the summer, the port clear cut about 80 acres of land along the Hudson in the town of Bethlehem without the proper federal permits. Applying for those permits and getting the approval takes time. So in order to get back on track with the project, the port has decided to forego that $30 million. 
you know, neighbors in Bethlehem had complained about the clear cutting. And that's what really brought it to the attention of the feds. And now it looks like the port has decided it's worth it to give up that 30 mil just to get the project back on track, because that's a a major deal for this area. You know, they're, they're touting it as, you know, bringing good paying jobs, you know, to people who, you know, might be living in um, areas of Albany where they could get to those jobs easily. And so it looks like it could be a big economic engine and they just don't want to want to wait any longer. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on that as it develops. So let's move on to a story that we discussed on this podcast recently, and that was also very popular online a few weeks ago. It's the story of John Romano, who in 2004, as a 16-year-old, brought a shotgun to Columbia High School and opened fire on students. He injured the teacher who tackled him, but then he did more than 15 years in prison. He was released in 2020, and since then he's been a vocal advocate for increasing mental health services and support But he was brutally attacked at the end of August, where he worked at an organization helping the homeless. He's since taken to TikTok about that experience. So tell us, what did we learn this week? So John Romano has a TikTok account that existed previous to this uh, catastrophic attack at the end of August. And, you know, he had been posting on it about his time in prison and about the need for access to good quality mental health care. But after the attack and after he was, you know, became well enough, he started posting videos where he, he has, you know, revealed his account of what happened to him. And it's quite horrific. Um, So I've been in the hospital for the past 10 days or so. Uh, I was attacked uh, by somebody with a machete. And I don't have the use of my arms, my hands, my legs, or my feet. Once I realized it existed and we wrote the story, it took me a few days before I went to actually look at his TikTok videos about this because I, I knew it could be very upsetting. And he, he goes into detail about what set off the man who attacked him and what he experienced while he was being attacked. And he was attacked, it sounds like, by two swords. The man was wielding two swords and and came at him and, you know, first attacked him on his legs and he was trying to protect himself. You know, he describes blacking out and then waking up and the man was, was hitting him in the arms. It's, just, it's really horrific. And uh, I lie here, unable to move my limbs that much. Um... And I ask myself, why am I still alive? Why am I going through this? And um, I guess I have more lessons to learn in life. But, you know, I will say that, you know, in the videos, John is very stoic and matter of fact. And there are times when he, I guess, where he's, he's not as upbeat, where he talks about the fact that he has lost his independence and he knows that he has a long road back. What gets me through it is just thinking that one day, not only will I be able to come through this a better person, but that hopefully I can help others somehow, some way. He already has a following and these, you know, videos have drawn in, as you can imagine, millions of viewers. And it's just, it's a, a, a remarkable story, and I, I think we'll be we'll be watching him for a long time to come to see how this how his recovery evolves. Yeah, remarkable was the word that immediately came to mind as I, I heard you detailing this story for sure. Um, head over to timesunion.com again to read more on that. Um, let's go to a story that kind of takes us ahead a couple months in time. If you are, you know, one of those people who is like, no, it's too early to start thinking about the holidays. It's not even October yet. Uh, we are at the Times Union thinking about the holidays because the story that popped up this week was that the Capitol Lights in the Park, which is an annual holiday lights display, might not happen this year. What's going on there? It's another year where Capitol Holiday Lights in the Park is in danger of not happening. The uh, light display has been put on for 
25 years as a fundraiser for the Albany Police Athletic League, and it has been based at Washington Park in Albany. This has grown over the years. Steve Hughes's reporting said it started out with 30 displays and then grew to more than 120. And over the years, as people got to know that it was there, they would go. So the neighbors don't like the traffic. The Washington Park Conservancy is is worried about damage to the grounds. Last year, the city gave a reprieve to PAL to say, okay, you can hold it here this year, but this is the last year you can do it. So now we're at at the time of year where PAL needs to start setting this thing up. In mid-October, they start doing the work to get this uh, display set up. And right now they have not yet secured a location for this year's display. PAL said that it It has enough money in its coffers to fund its programs for the coming year if if it does not do holiday lights in the park. However, after that, they would be in trouble financially. PAL does support a lot of programming for kids in the Albany Albany area. These are like after-school programs and summer programs, athletic programs. They do team mentoring and leadership programs. The money goes to things that are very valuable for the community as a whole. But as of right now, they're in danger of not having uh, a location for their major fundraiser. So we will stay tuned and we'll have to see what happens. Indeed. It seems like it's cutting it real close here at this point. Yes, it is for them. And, you know, this is what happened last year. They put out the call about this time of year to say, hey, oh, we're in big trouble. And that's when the city came forward and said, hey, okay, you can have one more year. I don't know that the city has a a plan to offer them to help at this point. All right. We'll keep an eye on that. One last thing before I let you go. I personally am craving apple cider donuts. (laughs) You know, I have to say someone in my household arrived home last night carrying a bag of apple cider donuts. So you're not the only one. Oh boy. Yes. But tell us if you are craving apple cider donuts, what would you recommend? I would recommend that you check out timesunion.com where we are featuring the ultimate guide to apple cider donuts in New York. Ah! Exactly. If you want to find a location near you or even far away from you where you can encounter some apple cider donuts, and perhaps do a little leaf peeping, we've got you covered. That is most excellent. Very seasonal. Adirondacks, into the Hudson Valley, and places beyond. Delightful. All right. Thank you so much, Susan. We will check back in with you at another time. All right. Thanks, Jess. Take care. As always, you can learn more about all of the topics and issues we discuss on this podcast at timesunion.com. And you can follow Susan Mahalik on Twitter at edittrix, that is E-D-I-T-R-I-C-K-S. After the break, extraterrestrial intelligence, flying saucers, are they real? We'll talk to a University at Albany professor who studies unidentified aerial phenomena. If you're enjoying this podcast, take advantage of all the Times Union has to offer and support our efforts to bring in you award-winning journalism by becoming a Times Union member today. Go to timesunion.com slash subscribe. Welcome back. You're listening to The Eagle, a Times Union podcast. I'm Jessica Marshall. As a lifelong X-Files fan myself, my curiosity was piqued when I heard that a University at Albany professor was studying UFOs. Actually, not UFOs or unidentified flying objects as we science fiction fans know them. We are actually talking here about UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. According to University at Albany physics professor Kevin Knuth, it underwent a bit of a brand refresh. The impetus for the rebranding was the fact that there were those in the government who needed to brief people in Congress about what they had learned about these objects or these phenomena. 
when they used the term UFO, they were met with closed doors. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to be briefed. Um, so they decided we need to come up with another term so that we can can get these doors open and get people listening because this is a serious matter and we need people to listen. What we're talking about here is more well known in the annals of science fiction. But it's not science fiction, it's real, according to a guy who studies them. Typically this is meant to be some type of aerial phenomenon, something in the air, either a craft, um, maybe an artificial phenomenon, artificial object, or it could be a natural phenomenon, both of which is not not well understood or not not identified, not known. Kevin Knuth was just starting out as a PhD candidate at Montana State University in the late 80s when UAPs first crossed his radar. He had just moved there from Wisconsin, and on one of the first nights he was there, he saw a story on the news about a cattle mutilation at a local ranch. And it was all over the news. People were in a bit of a panic. There were UFOs observed in the area that night. So I was watching this on the news, thinking, wow, this is really pretty bizarre. The next day, he and his fellow PhD candidates were talking about how crazy that news story was. A tenured physics professor overheard them and chimed in. He said, this stuff happens a lot around here. In fact, he told them, his friends at nearby Malmstrom Air Force Base say they see UFOs flying over nuclear weapons test sites and shutting down the intercontinental ballistics missiles. When the professor walked away, I'll, I'll be honest, we laughed, we laughed very hard because it was hard to believe that story was true because all I could imagine was if you had UFOs flying over our nuclear weapon sites, shutting down the nuclear missiles, turning them off basically, I would have imagined all oh, heck would break loose. I mean, the Air Force would be all over this. There would be, it would be a big, a big deal, right? Flash forward about 30 years. It's 2015. Professor Knuth was prepping a lecture about astrophysics. His students said they wanted to know about the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligent life visiting Earth. And I stumbled on the a YouTube video of a press conference that was held by a gentleman named Robert Hastings and this press conference was held at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. in 2010. And the topic was on UFOs shutting down our nuclear missiles. <laughs> Your mouth must have dropped open, right? I just sat there mouth agape watching this thinking, oh my God, this is actually real. Knuth started researching all he could about UAPs. Two years later, in 2017, the New York Times broke a story that the Pentagon had officially been studying UAPs. But their data, of course, was classified. Outside of those few with clearance, the scientific community at large had been left in the dark. That got Knuth thinking. Scientists really ought to have been on the ball from the beginning. And instead of laughing about ah, ha, ha, flying saucers and little green men, I thought maybe scientists curiosity should have been piqued instead of, you know, this derision and ridicule. The Navy released three videos of UAPs that it had encountered. Knuth looked closely at them. And that's when his studies of the unknown kicked into high gear. Tell me, you know, in a nutshell, how does a physicist kind of contribute to this? Like, what is important to know from a physics perspective about UAPs? So I looked at a few cases where I had some video, as in the Navy's case, where there was some radar data or summaries of radar data. I thought, at the very least, I can try to estimate their speeds and accelerations. And I thought that's a good starting point because the if the speeds and accelerations turn out to be unusual, that'll tell you a lot about the objects and what they can't be. Um, sure. And according to eyewitness testimony, they, they, very often you have people just saying speed was impossible or you know instantaneous. Mm -hmm. and 
you know, so apparently these things are quite fast. So one of the things I thought I can probably answer the question, how fast are these objects at, at, at times or how fast can they be? The answer was quite astounding. The, these objects were accelerating at rates from 75 times the acceleration of gravity all the way up wow. to 6,000 times the acceleration of gravity. We call, we call those Gs. For reference here, a fighter pilot can withstand up to 10 Gs, but only for very short periods of time, maybe even just seconds. 6,000 Gs would be <laughs> unthinkable, to say the it's, least. It's unthinkable. Our new F-35 uh, fighters at 13 and a half Gs, their wings would mm -hmm. get ripped off. So wow. at a thousand G acceleration, that person is a puddle on the floor. There's, there's, yeah. no, there's no getting around that. Mm -hmm. Something weird is going on here. This is clearly not a natural phenomenon. Things don't just naturally accelerate at these rates. And this is clearly under intelligent control. So somebody has made something pretty fantastic. And so that was, a, you know, it was an exciting moment. And it was an exciting moment to be able to show that conclusively. That discovery of how impossibly fast these recorded UAPs were going, that got the attention of UAPX. That's a nonprofit organization dedicated to the study of, you guessed it, UAPs. The two guys who founded it were on duty during the 2004 naval encounter that Knuth mentioned. It's called the Tic Tac Encounter because the UAP looked like, well, a Tic Tac. So I got in, invited to join the UAPX group, Kevin Day and um, Gary Voris. Kevin Day calls me up and says, hey, I saw that you were interested in, you know, a physicist interested in studying UAPs. Do you want to, do you want to work with us? We want to go back to um, Southern California where we observed these UAPs in 2004 and we want to find out what these things are. We want to see if we can find them again and collect some data on them. I was sure that sounds like fun. Yeah, let's let's try it. In July of 2021, Knuth went out to Southern California with a team of researchers from UAPX. They brought an array of high-tech gadgets and sensors with them. Infrared video cameras, computer-controlled visible light cameras, radiation detectors, high-energy particle detectors, etc. They perched on top of a building in Laguna Beach. And they watched the skies for five days. Now, did they find anything? We, we found what we call ambiguities, you know, objects that we can't identify and are having trouble understanding in some cases. There was one time especially where we were witnessing these objects while we were recording them, which was interesting. That must have been a thrill. Knuth and his colleagues weren't getting paid for this endeavor. Neither NASA nor the NSF were interested in footing the bill, but the documentary film production company Omnium Media was interested. They made the research adventure possible, and they made a film about it. The result of that is the movie A Tear in the Sky. The doc a documentary team came with us out to Laguna Beach and basically filmed us doing our work. A Tear in the Sky is streaming on Amazon Prime, narrated by none other than Captain Kirk himself, William Shatner. What has made mankind is an insatiable curiosity. Insatiable. What is that? Nobody knows. The phenomenon. So with all the research Knuth has helped collect with UAPX and the research he's done on his own, I had one more question. Do you have any guesses as to what any of this could be? Yes, I have a few ideas. Like I said, I'm interested in the subset of objects that appear to be some kind of structured craft. And whatever these structured craft are, they are vastly technologically superior to whatever we have. We don't have any equipment or fighter planes or anything that can get obtain anything near that type of acceleration or speed. And do so. Well, when you're talking about different. we, are you talking about the United States or are you talking uh, about just the human race? I'm talking, I, I guess, about the human race. <laughs> the, okay. I, we don't, yeah, we don't know of any country that can do what these objects can do. Congress has admitted this much. So, so we don't know who 
those the British the British MOD likes to call them those people. We don't know who those people are, <laughs> and so you know, where where are they from? Who are they? What are they doing here? You know, these are all important questions, and and it, and it's and they're not easy to resolve. You know, are these craft are these craft occupied by by occupants by biological occupants? Are these craft actually autonomous probes? Um, they could easily be that as well. Um, it could be some mixture of things. Some of them could be autonomous. Some could be occupied. Um, are they remote controlled? Are the um, there's, there's a lot of questions involved, and and those answers just don't exist at this point. And I and I really don't think anyone knows, including our government or other governments. I think they have some ideas, but in some cases, but I think the answers are going to be surprising and complicated. A Tear in the Sky is now streaming on Prime Video. All right, that's it for this week. I'm Jessica Marshall at Jess underscore on underscore ice on Twitter. Coming up, we're going to take a few weeks hiatus from the Eagle. That's because we are hard at work on a brand new limited series podcast about the disappearance of Jalik Rainwalker, the 12-year-old boy who went missing from Washington County almost 15 years ago. His case was ruled a probable child homicide, but no one has ever been charged, and his body has never been found. We'll take a deep dive into the case and try to find out what happened to him. In the meantime, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram, or head on over to timesunion.com for the latest news and features. The Eagle is a production of the Times Union. It's produced and edited by me, Jessica Marshall, with help from the Times Union digital team and the newsroom. Special thanks this week to Susan Mahalik for her contribution to this episode. 